There we go. Fantastic. Hi, Michael. How are you, man? All right. Without further ado, since we've been screwing around here, I'm going to get started. Thank you all for joining. Playing a little bit with the, uh, with the, uh, the settings here, making sure video quality is pretty good. Welcome to working through the executive assistant to get more meetings with executive. Had a lot of fun uh, putting this together, so I hope you guys are going to enjoy it. I'm going to jump right in. Let's rock and roll. So uh, a couple housekeeping items as always. If you have questions for me, it is going to be ideal for you to email those questions to me. TownsendWorld.gmail.com. There we go. People are sending me stuff. Fantastic. I love it. Chris Donaldson. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I'll try to answer them all. In fact, I'll answer them all. I'll stick around till the end and, and uh, we shouldn't have any issues. You know, you guys can leave whenever you want, obviously, but... Uh, um, I'm going to uh, stick around and answer your questions. That's, uh, that's what I do. Uh, at the end of this, I will be sending a copy of the recording out to everybody. So you get a copy. If you miss anything, no, no worries. Uh, I don't have a lot of handouts or, or additional tools with this one. So there, so there really won't be a, uh, a Dropbox associated with it. But if you, if you need more Intel or, or information about anything you, you hear on this, please don't hesitate. Shoot me an email. Uh, happy to help. Quick note about our topic today. So when I started this out, this was a very, I'll say, tactical conversation. It was focused on, you know, exactly how do you get to the gate or get through the gatekeeper? How do you actually get an executive meeting? Because again and again, I hear from folks, you know, we need to uh, we need to position higher, and we're just not able to get to these these gatekeepers. As I started to build out the presentation, uh, I, I wanted to make it a little more of a holistic kind of uh, uh, working session, right? And what I mean by that is getting to the gatekeeper is really only part of the problem. There's there's tactics and mechanics, and I'll actually talk about those at the end, you know, the, the, the exactly why, the specifically why, uh, or I should say specifically how that you, you will get to the gatekeeper or get through the gatekeeper. Um, but I wanted to spend a bunch of time talking about selling to executives and the importance of it, particularly the importance of selling to executives, you know, in 2016 with so much knowledge and power living on the, on the buyer side of the fence. So... What I often find is the mechanics of getting through the gatekeeper to the executive are much, much easier than people knowing why they're getting there in the first place or, or what they're even there to talk about. Um, you know, a lot of folks saying, hey, we want to want to, you know, get in front of the CIO or get in front of the CEO. And, and my question is, what uh, what are you going to say when you walk in the room or when you're on the phone call? And, and a lot of times the message or their purpose for being there isn't really aligned with something that an actual C-Level would want to uh, talk about. So this is a, a probably a, a broader conversation than you thought you were having. Um, folks who are already sold on always getting to the uh, the executive and, and, and making sure they have some executive positioning, hopefully won't be bored. Hopefully they reinforce some of what you're, what you're already doing. But for those of you who uh, maybe don't get to an executive often enough, those of you who uh, have a lot of reasons or excuses why it's not necessary or you're believing your prospect, hopefully I'll challenge you with some of that. So we'll launch in. We're divided into three parts today. One is uh, the why. The why do we need to get in front of executives? Why do they matter in the sales process? The second is when, right? Um, it, it's fantastic when we can start at the top and work our way down. But uh, you know, a lot of times the challenge is knowing exactly when we need to move from maybe a functional contact or somebody who's been our, our point person and, and, and go from there. Um, and then the second, uh, or so the third part is then watch you get into specifically how. So I want to start with this little graphic and I, I think I've got some folks, uh, there we go. Got some nice folks hearing me, that's fantastic. By the way, a quick, quick note on this. If for some reason the screen locks up, easiest thing to do, well, you can obviously email me, but I'm talking here so it's not gonna do a lot of work. The easiest thing to do is simply shut down live stream or close out the browser and reopen again usually works. Hope you're studying this picture. I'll get to it in a second. Um, the folks uh, at eSource, I think there's some joining me. I actually did this for the first time with them. But I want everybody to take a look at this picture. And um, it's funny, right? Hopefully you've already chuckled and gotten that. But I want you to, to look at it because I'm going to ask you a couple questions. And uh, you need to memorize it because it's on the next page. So we'll, we'll see how it is, right? So you get some cavemans, wheels, rocks, all sorts of stuff going on there. Let's go to the next uh, page and I'll... I'll ask you some questions and I can always go back to this picture, but, but let's, let, let's cover this. So the first question I have is what is the caveman selling, right? It's not designed to be a memory quiz. I'll flip back for you. The caveman quite obviously is selling some, some wheels, 
right? Some round wheels, right? This isn't a trick question. Um, that's the caveman on the uh, on my left, I guess. I guess it'd be on. I don't know what it is for you. That's well, your left tool. So first question: What's the caveman say? Selling some wheels. What is the wheel for? Right? Very easy question. The wheel is not surprisingly to go on the cart. Right? Right now, apparently these guys are pulling a, a box of rocks there or something like that. I think that's an owl or something crazy there. And they've got some square wheels. They don't seem to be doing a good job, but it's pretty obvious that the wheels are designed to go on that on that cart. How will the wheel help these nice cavemen? Well, again, not not a not a shocking uh, question here, right? In 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 all likelihood, my assumption is the wheels on the cart would help the cart roll smoother. Maybe instead of digging into the dirt, it would it would roll on top of them, right? So pretty pretty easy so far. Here's the next question: What are the rocks for? Hmm, what are the rocks for? Let's go back there again. Right? Well, I, 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 I see there's a crazy owl looking thing there. The guys are pulling, but I, I don't know what the rocks are for, right? Uh, that is a non-intuitive part of this of this visual here. Um, in case you haven't figured out where I'm going, I use this visual to help people understand depth of discovery in the sales process, right? And the questions we ask and then often the questions we don't ask. Um, a lot of times we we know what our product looks like. We know we know uh, what our prospect is doing today that we think we're going to help them with. We haven't necessarily stopped to ask ourselves what is what we're going to do for them going to do for them. But there's one more level, right? In addition to wondering what the rocks for, I am curious as to who asked them to go with the rocks. All right. Now, maybe these guys just decided to go load up a, a bucket with rocks. I don't know. I mean, they're cavemen. But in the sales situations that we go through, I would say that the vast majority of times, we don't think of selling to organizations. We think that we're selling to people. And we kind of forget that those people live inside of organizations. And, and most things that happen are the result of requests or, or, or demands or orders or initiatives that other people have given. And, and I want this to be a, a paradigm for us to, to think through as, we're, as we're, we're working on the how do you sell to executives and why do you go to them and why does it matter? Um, obviously, if you've got a nice set of wheels, it's not going to be too hard to convince the cavemen if they actually will, uh, you know, turn around for a second, that maybe it's going to make their life easier. However, knowing what the rocks are for, uh, and then more importantly, who asked them to go bring the rocks, right? What other person was involved here creates a whole nother path of selling that, that many times we just we just simply ignore. So hopefully that makes sense for you. Um, I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about what I call the self-perpetuating sales myth, right? Most of the time when I'm when I'm coaching a, a, a team on, on an opportunity, uh, one of the first things they want to make sure I know is that we're talking to the decision maker and they have a budget, right? And and I'm 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 hoping that you're thinking about uh, some deals in your personal pipeline or situation in your own life, you know, it's funny because it's the first thing they want to assure me, uh, you know, so that I don't ask. Of, of course, my next question is always, how do you know? And they kind of look at me and say, well, they, they, I, I know I'm talking to the decision maker and they because they told me. Hmm. Let's think about that for a second. You know, have, have you actually ever been through a budget process? Have you ever, you know, dealt with, you know, spending or I should say allocating and then spending budget money? Uh, in reality, and I've written a lot of posts on this. I think I've even done some videos on this. I don't believe in 2016 there is a concept of a budget. Companies do not take a pile of money, put it in a little lockbox, hand it to somebody and say, go spend it. At the beginning of the year, you're more than welcome to submit your items for approval in a budget. You may actually get those items approved as in, you know, you're going to build a new website next year. That doesn't mean the money's yours or that you're ever going to get it, right? And, and here's, here's why. Because in January, I can be told that I have I don't know, $100,000 to upgrade our website. And it's February, it's March, it's April, and, and, and my forecast is going down or I'm not hitting my numbers. And all of a sudden, the CFO says, yeah, we're not going to spend the money we thought we were going to spend. All right? Now, they, they don't necessarily send out an announcement. They don't necessarily send out a memo to everybody. Stop the spending. Don't, don't, don't buy anything. But that money's not going to be spent. And, and a lot of times, the people who thought they have money don't get to spend that. It disappears. They're still talking to vendors. They're still, you know, uh, acting as if they're going to make a purchase, trying to decide who they're going to go with, how they're going to, how they're going to implement. That money was taken away from them and they won't know until they walk hand in hand with a the vendor they've selected. 
you know, in front of the, the budget committee or whatever it is, and then the CFO, who ultimately is the decision maker in this case, says, no, we're not going to spend it. Let's talk about decision makers. Now, it, it kind of torques people when I say this because the question is, well, if there's no decision maker, you know, who makes the decision? The answer is there are decision makers, and, and every company uh, has either a formal or, infra or informal process for making decisions, but it is rare that there's a single person who just, you know, like, like the will of God, decides uh, here's what we're going to do. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of good ways to think about decision making, and, and we're not going to get them all today, but uh, Miller Hyman has a really good way. They, they, they call their buyer roles. So they talk about the economic buyer, the one who has the ultimate signing authority, the one who can say no when others say yes, and yes when others say no. They talk about the technical buyer who evaluates you know, what you're doing on this technicalities. They talk about the coach. They talk about uh, the user buyer. So the important thing I want you to get here is that companies, whether they have an informal or a formal process for decision-making, do things in, in a collaborative way. There's a constituency of decision makers. And when we are talking to a single person, regardless of the fact that they've been anointed by the CEO to make this decision, we are really not getting the whole picture. So I actually use the concepts of budget and decision maker as two very accurate uh, signs, if you will, that the sales team has got some blinders on, right? They have accepted there's a budget. They've accepted there's a decision maker. And, and, and then we start talking about what's next versus let's get rid of those, you know, archaic concepts that don't really apply in 2016. And let's think about selling in a, in a whole different way. So let's spend a little bit of time on uh, what is an executive, right? How do we know if we're actually talking to an executive, right? So this one is, this is my definition of an executive and a leader. And it really reflects, you know, uh, both my own personal experience in running a company. It also uh, reflects a lot of experience coaching, you know, executives and folks who lead organizations. And executives, first and foremost, are people who make decisions, right? Yes, no, buy, sell, acquire, kill them, whatever, right? The key is they have the capacity to make decisions without enough information. And executives accept that in all cases, their, their decision will at least be partly wrong, right? Real, real true executives, real leaders know that they're, they're on a journey. They're taking their company someplace. They're not, you know, making a proclamation, getting into a destination and, and, and you know, spiking the ball and walking off the field. So there has to be an acknowledgement that the journey they're taking, whether it's in their own decision-making process or with a vendor, is going to meander. So one of the things that really will set a leader apart, an executive part, is they understand that, that they're not going to make a decision once and move on. Contrast that with people in managerial roles or individual contributor roles. They tend to have a very, very specific focus on getting things right, on not making mistakes. First and foremost, executives understand that mistakes are part of the learning process. They know that the choices they make will upset, hurt, disappoint some people, etc. And then they'll have to make another decision to course correct. It, it, it is what it is. Um, executives, and this is obviously a, 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 a humorous organization chart, but... One of the questions I always ask when somebody is saying, I'm talking to the decision maker, or I don't need to go to the executive, or this person, what have you, is, do you have an organization chart? Because executives actually live on an organization chart, right? There's, 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 a, there's a place they have you know, in the organizational hierarchy, there's reporting structure, there's people that report to them, there's people that they report to, and they have specific accountabilities above, and, and they've created accountabilities below them. So uh, I'm gonna go to a list on the next slide of, of kind of the specific things you can do to determine if you're talking to an executive, but I want to be clear, the reason I'm doing this is once we move away from the concept of who's the decision maker, who's the all-powerful person who with a swipe of a pen can make everything happen, which doesn't exist, and we have to acknowledge that to move opportunities, particularly complex opportunities through uh, organizations, um, we need to understand who these people are, how they think, where they live, and... Uh, you know, and, and, and then we can worry about how to get to them. Uh, one of the things that I want to make sure to cover before, before the end of this, this conversation is the concept of how does decision making and how do executive you know, interactions uh, take place in, in the era of, of SaaS, right? Software as a service. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, I read an article yesterday or the other day, which very simple. Uh, I only had to read a little bit. The title was, 
can you guess how many salespeople Slack has, right? For those of you who don't know, Slack is the, uh, the instant messaging platform, the collaboration platform for organizations. Well, the answer is they have none, right? They, they don't sell top down. They sell bottom up, right? They sell by getting the entire organization, you know, interested in what they're doing and using it, hooked on it, and then, uh, and then adding more features and value around it. So it's, it's really kind of fascinating. But I want to talk about that at the end and, and the concepts of SaaS, but we'll, we'll kind of get into more traditional higher dollar sales stuff first. So if, if you're going to determine whether or not you need to get to an executive and then figure out how to get to that executive, it certainly helps to understand you know, what they look like. How do you know if you're actually talking to one or if you're not? How do you know what talking to one would look like? Executives have direct reports. If, if you're talking to the special envoy you know, of the CEO or the strategic blah, blah, so-and-so, who has been empowered to do all this big stuff, but has no direct reports, that person actually has no, no authority. And uh, it's really funny because the, the number of deals that I come across where people try to convince me that the person they're talking to, even though their org chart doesn't make them look all that important, they actually have a lot of influence. Well, where's that coming from? The org chart doesn't show it. It's their version of, of what they say is, is happening. So it doesn't mean anything. Responsibility for profit and loss. Executives, and I'll get into this some more, don't, don't think about how things are going to get done. They think about where they're going to go, right? Profit and loss is the ultimate measure of any organization. That's what people care about. Do we have enough revenue? How are our expenses? Are we generating a profit or loss? So people that think in terms of profit or loss and can relate whatever it is they're talking to you about to revenue, to expense, to profit increase, to loss reduction, may just be an executive. People who tell you we need to have this up and running next quarter because what we're doing today isn't working and uh, we really don't like it and it's got to be better, that's not an executive because executives don't think that way. Executives don't care if things are better or worse. They care if revenue is up and expenses are down. It's that simple. Uh, rather than budget, executives have a very clear line of sight to how much they can sign off on. What decisions are they empowered to make, right? When somebody says, I'm empowered to make this decision, I always like to ask, what other decisions are you empowered to make, right? What is your sign-off authority? How big of a check can you sign? And by the way, I do mean sign. I don't mean recommend to somebody. I mean sign uh, without going to somebody else. It's actually a pretty simple question. Uh, one of the things that will surprise you is that in most companies, even up to VP level, there is surprisingly little or small signing authority available to folks these days. Uh, there is tremendous financial oversight. There's tremendous expectation that people will be diligent with the company funds. And uh, you would be surprised how complicated it is to get sign off on a $10,000 deal. There are typically multiple signatures required. Uh, I know companies personally that, you know, deals in the $100,000 range, and these are big companies, required board level oversight and approval. It's absurd, but it happens. Executives understand the buying process. And when I say buying process, I want to be very clear. Somebody telling you they make a decision or it's their decision, that's not a buying process. I, I like to play a little game sometimes with folks that I am uh, coaching on the deal. And I say, great, I go to whiteboards, helpful. I say, here's today, and I draw a little line, and I draw a line this way. And I say, here's when a check deposits in our account. Walk me through the steps, right? And what I'm looking for is, have they done the due diligence to really understand that even when this person says, yes, I want to do it, who do they go to to initiate, let's say, legal review of the SOW or the MSA or whatever it is? Who do they go to to sign the MSA or the SOW? Chances are they're, they're not the signing authority, even if, and by I mean signature, not money, even if uh, they might be the real decision maker. But it sure helps if they know who's going to sign the contract. When people say, well, I got to go to my boss who's the VP, and he just signs it. My guess is that VP doesn't even sign it. That VP still has to take it to a contracts person and sign it. There's a whole procurement process, right? When procurement's complete and you have to do with procurement stuff, how do you actually generate invoices? How do you get in there as a, as a, as a, as a, a vendor so they can actually cut your checks? I'm not saying it's important to go to the mat on this every time, but executives know how to move deals through their company because they've done it multiple times, right? They don't 
think that the deal stops after they say yes and they hand it to their boss and magic happens. They actually get the concept. So if somebody understands all that, they're probably an executive. If, if they're fuzzy on it, they're not an executive. Uh, executives have variable compensation tied to outcomes. Fastest way to determine you're talking to an executive is to ask two questions. What percentage of your compensation is tied to a bonus or some other variable means, right? What percent? And how is that determined, right? If it's an annual review with subject subjective criteria, it's not, an, uh, it's not an executive. Executives have specific compensation plans tied to quarterly business objectives, MBOs, management by objectives. There's lots of acronyms, but somebody who's an objective, sorry, somebody who's an executive has very specific things that they've got to get done this quarter and this year, and they're held accountable to them, and their compensation is tied to them. Um, and here's another hint slash precursor. If whatever it is you're selling is not tied to either the executive who you're not talking to or the executive you're talking to's quarterly business objectives, annual business, if it doesn't relate to that, it's not going to happen, right? I hate to break it to you. The number of deals you go through where people swear something's going to happen, but there's no connection to something the business needs done, doesn't happen. So a couple little little giveaways here. One of the things you can ask is whose name will be on the contract? Whose pen goes on there? A manager is not going to say me. A director is not going to say me. In most cases, a VP is not going to say me, right? To sign a contract, you need to be essentially an officer of the company. You need to have signing authority for the company. You need to have the legal right to enter the company into binding agreements, right? Uh, that's very different than it's my decision, okay? Um, if somebody, in fact, says it's my name on the bottom, and it may be, the question you want to ask then is, is there anywhere else you're going to seek approval, formal or informal, before putting your name on it, right? The, the, the nice thing about finding the person whose name goes on the contract is that you got them there. The, the bad thing is that doesn't mean they're willing to do it without asking other people because people don't like to make a mistake. Nobody wants to be, you know, the one, one who, who wrote the bad deal. So even the real decision makers, the executives, talk to others, ask others. Well, I run it by the CEO. Okay, cool. Is that a formal process, an informal? How do you do that? What else have you, you know, taken to the CEO that's this price tag? Uh, is this the first time you're putting your name on a $100,000 deal for your company? Or do you, you know, basically sign $100,000 deals, purchasing stuff all the time? Those things matter. Hello, Janine. How are you? So if you got questions or things you want me to cover, send me an email. Uh, you know, I can ramble all day. You guys know that. But uh, more than happy to address specific things that you guys want to talk about. All right. What is the cost of not getting to an executive? Well, uh, you know, your competitor might. I generally not worry about that. To me, the greatest cost of not getting to an executive is the reality that the vast majority of opportunities, deals, whatever you're working on, ends in no decision, right? And, and anybody who says, oh, no, that, that doesn't happen is not telling the truth, all right? How many times have we come back, you know, after talking to a prospect with a deal that was 60, 80%, who knows what, oh, it's a sure thing, and aw shucks, it got pushed till next quarter. Oh man, the CEO vetoed it at the last minute, they had some budget cuts. Oh, you know, they decided they couldn't do it, they, they, didn't, they weren't able to allocate the resources. Those are all nice ways of saying, we did nothing. We just spent six months pretending to buy from you, you spent six months pretending to sell to us, and we said, never mind, let's try it again later. Now, the happy salesperson comes back to the manager, the, you know, the, 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 the sales VP, and says, well, the good news is they're, they're still committed. They really want to do this, but it's going to be next quarter. It's going to be after the new year. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be. That's the story we tell. And frankly, it's nonsense. I want to tell you guys a story. And I did a, a blog post, not a blog post, I did a, a LinkedIn article, and I, I was kind of cheeky, and I, I, I wrote up a screenplay on why most deals end in no decision. But here's what I want you to imagine, right? You're the CEO. And you're walking down the hall, you're going from meeting to meeting, and, and somebody, you know, who, who obviously works in your company, uh, some bright young rising star comes up, oh, Mr. Johnson, or Mrs. Johnson. So nice to see you, look great. Hey, that's a great suit. Oh, you, how, Jeremy, how's the wife? How's the kids? Whatever, right? Nice small talk. And they say, oh, Mr. Johnson, we've been working on some really exciting things down in, in HR, and uh, we think we've got some recommendations that are really going to save the company some money and allow us to be more efficient and, and attract top tier talent, you know, into the future, right? That's what, that's what somebody's saying to you. Now, you're a CEO. You're on your way to a meeting. You've been trained in, in 
motivating your people and inspiring them and, and, and you know, your people skills and sensitivity training. So what you don't say is, I, I'm sorry, what, what the hell are you talking about? Right? You don't say that. What you say is, wow, Jeremy, sounds exciting. I'm sure you, you and your team are doing great stuff. Really look forward to hearing about your progress. That's what you say, right? You go off to your, your little meeting. Jeremy is elated, right? Jeremy, you know, absolutely on fire, runs back to the apartment, starts telling everybody, you're not going to believe this. I saw, I saw Bob or whatever his name I said it was in the hall. And he's totally on board with our project. He's given us a green light. You know, he can't wait to see what we come up with. You know, uh, Margaret, did you, did you get that list of vendors we had, we had kind of started to work on of, of the technology that we could use for this? Let's get them on the phone. Let's tell them we got a green light. Let's get a project going. We need to set up a regular standing call internally. We'll have a focus set of meetings, on and on and on, right? That's what's happening. Vendors are getting calls. They're coming in, right? They're being told they have budget. You know, this has the CEO's visibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The CEO was on his way to a meeting and really wasn't listening. That's the bad news here. You have no idea what's going on except this massive enthusiasm and momentum that's building because of a simple hallway conversation. Well, three months later, after the vendors have flown in and flown out and done their due diligence and everybody's done proposals and all sorts of stuff. And, and by the way, the team has even selected their vendor of choice, but they have the other bids, you know, so they can show they've done their due diligence. And... They go to the CEO's assistant and they say, you know, Marjorie or John or whoever, you know, we need to get on Big Bob's calendar. We're ready to present for his decision on blah, blah, blah. They get the meeting on the calendar. They send the agenda. Everybody's ready. And then the email comes back from Marjorie or John or whoever the assistant is saying, so sorry, you know, priorities have shifted. You know, Big Bob is, is dealing with the stuff at the board level. We need to push this out until next quarter, right? He's not going to say, what the hell have you guys been doing wasting your time? I never said that. He's not going to say that. He's going to say, oh boy, they, they're off on a wild goose chase. Just tell them, tell them other things have come up, right? I promise you, both through anecdotes and through actual situations that I validated, that is how the majority of these corporate initiatives happen. Somebody gets a wild hair up their butt, absolutely convinced that, you know, they've got the sanction of the executive team to go and spend the company's money and, and energy and resources, and there's no deal there never was. You got three sets of sales teams working on this stuff, spending money, flying on planes, doing stuff. Their jobs are distracted at the company. And at the end of the day, there was never an intention to do anything at all. Hmm? Oh, you, you don't believe me. Well, I'll tell you a little story. Personal story. You know, I like my stories. So this was a, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And this was, frankly, the first time that I really was confronted with this. I was part of a team that was assigned to help other account teams uh, to you know, win big deals or to, or to work on strategy, what have you. Really fun. And I got a call from a, a, a team that was working on a very large uh, regional carrier, right? A long distance carrier. This is back in the day when long distance cost money. I remember that. It was, it was awesome. Used to sell... Uh, Long distance for 38 cents a minute. Inbound 800 service. Man, that was amazing. Anyway, so they said, uh, yeah, uh, we're positioned with the right people. This deal's a go. This company is going to spend, I, I think it was like $100 million, $200 million or something like that. Um, to replace our competitor with our stuff. We've been involved for 12, 18 months. We've done the proof of concept, this, that, and the other thing. We're ready to go. I said, ah, anybody talk to the CFO? They said, well, no, we, we don't need to talk to CFO. We're talking to the decision maker. He's got budget. You know, what, what, what more do you possibly need? I said, well, you know, these big companies, they, they, they think a little differently about spending money. And, and in particular, they think differently about capital expense, which is when you have to buy stuff, you know, versus services or what have you. Um, so, you know, I, I really think we should... Talk to the CFO. Well, how do we need the CFO? Can't be possible. Well, lucky enough, I'd, I'd, I'd done a little digging, found out that their CFO went to college with our CEO. And I'll, and I'll bring this story around at the end, and I'll, I'll use the example of one way you can get in you know, to, see, to see important people. Long story short, I, I got the meeting. Uh, I asked the CFO through a referral from my CEO, or actually had my CEO ask. Uh, I wanted 10 minutes of his time. 
Literally, the meeting I asked for was 10 minutes because I knew in 10 minutes I could determine if this deal was going to move forward or it wasn't. Remember, full account team, four, five, six, eight people, plus all the ancillary resources, plus the trips and travel and dinners, had been working on this for 18 months. Day finally came. I, I had my, my, my meeting on the calendar with the CFO, and I was nervous. It was a phone meeting, thank God. I probably would have been sweating out my pits. And uh, I was nervous because if you're talking to a CFO of a Fortune you know, 100 company, you're not nervous. There's something wrong with you. And uh, he answered the phone at the appointed time. I actually called the assistant and then she patched me through. And I said, Mr. I, I can't even remember the guy's name. Uh, this is Townsend. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, I have a simple purpose for my call today, sir. And that is I want to make sure that the efforts and initiatives that, that, that my team are working on are in fact on your radar and, and aligned with priorities that you intend to, you know, execute, pull the trigger on, whatever I said, you know, by the end of this year. And he goes, oh, which project is that? I said, well, currently uh, our team is engaged with these folks and they're looking to replace this stuff with that stuff. And, you know, essentially it's a roadmap of, of, of the next three years to migrate from, you know, vendor A to our stuff. And he goes, oh yeah, I know about it. He goes, let me tell you that that's not happening. I said, well, uh, thank you for sharing that with me, sir. Could, could you please you know, share with me why not? And he said, it's simple. All that gear that you're talking about, I amortized on a five-year schedule two years ago, which means I have three years left. If I pull that stuff out and put yours in, I got to go back and rewrite all my books for the last two years and explain to my auditors why I'm doing this and why I took the write down. Never going to happen. The entire deal was killed because of stuff that had nothing to do with the technology, etc. It was on the CFO's radar. He wasn't going to go fight a war and get people to stop, you know, pretending to buy stuff, but he was never going to sign the deal for, for reasons that nobody could have understood unless they talked to him. Of course, I went back to the accounting and told them they, uh, they didn't believe me. They said, no, 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 our guy assures us. I said, well, I just talked to the CFO. So long story short, not getting to an executive, even for a five minute conversation to say, hey, does this have your attention, right? Initiatives that spend money don't bubble up and get told yes to. They come down and get executed. It's as simple as that. I'll keep going. Questions, you guys, email me. You're being very quiet. Hopefully you're paying attention. Hopefully I'm not boring you. Uh, hey, Howard, how's it going, man? Ah, uh, great question. So Howard asks, how frequently are executives willing to answer your probing questions? Um, I'm going to be a, a much more specific answer below in a couple slides, but long story short, 100% of the time, Howard, provided my questions and my purpose for asking them align with their interests. If I'm asking information for me, because I think I need to know it to, to get you to do something, nobody's going to talk to you. However, if I do some thinking about whether or not and how to align what I'm looking to understand with what's in their self-interest, they always answer. More on that in a minute. All right. I, I've seen this slide. I, I, I can't remember if I built it or I stole it, but I've been using basically some version of this slide for the past 15 or so years. Back in the day, uh, some folks... And I, I helped them out, built a whole class on how to sell to executives. Uh, back in the early days of my company, um, one of the services we offered, we would go and do a whole program on selling to executives. But one of the things I thought was very important was to understand how a sales process really works over time. And this is just one model of many. But more importantly, where do executives show up on their own, right? Part of what we're talking about is how to get to executives when we need it. But where do they tend to show up, you know, if, if given the choice, right? So if you think about a sales cycle, and, and these are the various steps, and then that, that curve is really the level of executive involvement, right? Executives for real opportunities always show up at the beginning. They are the ones responsible for identifying problems and opportunities, saying we're going to do something about it, and then handing it off. As soon as we're talking about identifying solutions and vendors, executives get scarce. As soon as we're evaluating vendors or even picking solutions, executives are never around on their own. They don't want to be there. They want to say, here's what has to happen. You go make it so. I'm going off to make the next decision or play golf or, or count my options or whatever, not to disparage them. They then will come back at the end to a certain extent to measure the success of the initiative and hold the people accountable for what they've done. So one way you can use this slide is to understand, sorry, my, my thing went off. I thought I had it on, uh, had it on mute there. 
Um, one way that you can use this slide is to understand, what is weird, I don't know. Um, has the executive participated in this process, right? If I'm talking to somebody who says, well, we've come up with this, we've decided departmentally, and then we're gonna go and talk to an executive about it, that's a problem, right? Because that means it didn't follow this model and an executive was never there at the beginning of it, which makes it that much more unlikely they will show up at the end. Hopefully that makes sense. Earlier is always better in terms of when you're going to you're, you're going to talk to the, the executive, right? The executive set the priorities, executive create your budget, right? If they weren't involved, it's likely you're not even selling to a real deal. If they were involved, right, I want to be helping them define those priorities. A lot of that requires a relationship. A lot of that requires selling far ahead of somebody ready to buy. When somebody calls you and says, hey, we're looking for a system to do this or a vendor to do this, that's latent need, right? A lot has happened, right? You're really far behind or stated differently, they're really far along. Well, how do I sell to non, sorry, that's existing need. How do I sell to latent need, which is when the problems are starting to show up? Well, that is you have to target these folks long before they're actually looking to solve the problem. You have to be willing to put in six months or a year's worth of work to build a relationship prior to selling. Now, I know that a lot of companies don't think that way. I know that a lot of you know sales organizations aren't set up for that kind of investment. But let's face it, in 2016, if you're not helping frame the problem for your potential customers, for the executives you want to serve, life gets a lot harder. So executives set priorities, they create budget, they establish timeline and priorities. I'm going to say this again because it's really important. If they hadn't done it, if the priorities you're being told are there, the budget you're being told it is, and the timing uh, has not been established by an executive somebody can name, that means the person you're talking to has come up, to, come up with these things and is hoping to get the executive to buy off on them. It doesn't work that way. Now, I'm going to caveat that. It doesn't work that way this time around. It doesn't mean you know, you're completely wasting your time, but the chances of somebody functionally saying, this is the budget, these are the priorities, this is the timing, getting up to an executive and in that one cycle, getting a yes are very, very low. The chances, if it's a critical initiative of that process, setting the stage for potentially a next year by budget allocation, et cetera, that might make sense. But you gotta understand there's a difference between a sales cycle and a budgeting cycle. There's a, there's a difference between a a learning cycle and a what should we do about this cycle and a buying cycle. The only challenge is thinking you're selling to people. I should say the only mistake is believing that you are selling to people who aren't really buying, who are learning. So learning to distinguish between, you know, is, is, this, is this deal really where my contact says it is or is this an initiative they're trying to bubble up from the bottom? All right. Time is flying here. So in the vast majority of cases, you're going to come into a game in motion, right? You're not coming into a situation where you're going to get to, you know, just magically get to set the stage, et cetera. It's ideal. So there's already a sales process in motion. The executive has already come and gone and said, we're going to do this and then, and then left the room, right? So we need to understand the difference between selling to versus selling through, right? Selling to an executive directly or selling through our contact. Um, selling through our contact is not going around them. It is, in fact a collaborative effort between you and your, your potential buyer. Now, how are you going to get somebody to allow you to sell through or with would be another way to say it? Well, you have to help them see that the path they're taking is unlikely to result in the outcome that they desire, right? You have to assume they're coming to you trying to make something happen. If they're simply fulfilling a request, hey, get me a price on this. We want to you know, look at options, so, so go run do. That might be a challenge. But if you're really talking to somebody in the line of business, who cares about the business and who wants to drive process improvement or technology improvement, then you're going to have to make an appeal to that person uh, that your expertise in selling is a value to them in terms of getting what they want. I want to close this deal. You want to implement some new technology, you know, so that your apartment, your, so your department is going to, is going to have more efficiency next year. Sometimes you have to have a really tough conversation with somebody saying, Based on my experience, the process you're following is very unlikely to, to be successful, right? Of course, you risk them saying, well, I know how to sell to my company or I know how my company works. And the question would be great. When was the last time that you actually 
brought a 50 or 100 or 200 thousand dollar investment from start to finish on your own and the answer is they, they haven't right these are the hard conversations that professional salespeople have that salespeople who care have and salespeople who aren't afraid of you know running into the reality that that this deal may not happen as i said before you got to be aware of this concept of well we're presenting for approval or you know we're, we we want to go to them with the entire idea including a solution of how we're going to sell it that's not going to close in the time frame you think it might close eventually might set you up for a, a further close but don't confuse that with a, a legitimate sales process when do you have to go around when is it really time to go uh, i would say there's a couple reasons obviously when your competitor is positioned higher than you right uh, or when your competitor has a material advantage in terms of product or service or, or relationship your, your competitor actually doesn't have to be positioned higher they just need to have an edge over you if I, if I if i feel that you know staying the course will will you know a they're going to buy b i'm going to get beat by somebody else then i have to go around my current decision maker because the only way i'm going to win is by changing the rules of the game right if i feel that basically how the game is structured today either the budgets that have been set or the timing or the buying criteria what have you put me at a disadvantage I have to seek to try and change those why would you play a game with rules set that you're gonna lose right if you wanted to win you would say I'm not gonna play the game until I can go change the rules so whenever the reward outweighs the risk right now going around people is always a challenge right you can hurt feelings you can burn bridges etc what I will tell you is that in in practical reality the the the, the percentage or, or the instance instances where going around somebody if done in a respectful way not necessarily a polite way but a respectful way where that has actually caused me to lose or have an enemy for life very very few there have been times right going around has come back to bite me uh i've gone around targets or you know contacts to the executive won the deal and then basically had an enemy in the company forever right which is not fun but you can work around it but i'll tell you that that is a far more that's far more of a perceived risk than a real risk right far more than a perceived problem we tend to fear that somehow the person you know uh who we're going around is going to hate us forever in reality well sure that that that, that could happen but what i'll tell you anybody else too? okay is that if you follow my next bit of advice which is you have a valid business reason for going most people will understand that what i will say is it's time to go around at the first sign of doubt the first sign you're thinking this may not be what it seems it's time to go around and, and i'll show you some very specific and i think i think uh non-intrusive ways there there's lots of ways to go around your contact without pissing them off so all right part three how are we going to do it coming up here on about 15 minutes left or so so get your questions in i'm happy to stick around and all that kind of stuff yeah good question andy i'll get to that in a second actually i'll read it i find too often that an initiative is stalled but my prospect won't say it primarily because the prospect recognize how much work went into the proposal process doesn't want to let me down or doesn't want to deliver bad news absolutely right so part of the challenge is if i'm asking you so is the project stalled you have a natural inclination to uh to not want to break bad news to me right um part of asking tough questions is a requirement that you ask them in a way that allows people to give you a, a hard answer right you need to be able to say you know you're not going to hurt my feelings sometimes simply saying hey i get it things happen i I'm, i just want to know and giving them permission to break some bad news to you the other is if a project is stalled there tends to be evidence that it is stalled because what else are we doing right when people say they're still deciding or they're still thinking about it do you really believe that right do, do you think the executives have your proposal printed out you know leather bound they're sitting in these nice comfy chairs with stogies and scotch you know sitting around a fire going what do we think about this right if if there's no ability if nobody can articulate what's happening exactly when they're scheduled to meet on this thing right then it's stalled right it's not sitting there in some magical pile you know neatly waiting to be queued up either somebody has this on their radar and they're going to make a decision or there's everything else 
So when somebody says, well, we haven't heard back from the executive team, that's a stalled initiative, right? That means that you know, nobody's looking at it, nobody cares, right? It also means, and, and, and sorry to be harsh about it, but you probably didn't do a good enough job up front understanding how they're gonna make a decision. Challenge is, stalled initiatives, you often have to ask, were they ever real in the first place? Were they ever really going to happen? And if they were, this gets back to somebody needs to have been able to articulate you know, uh, what's gonna to happen to come to a decision. The other thing is, if the project is stalled and your prospect can or won't give you an answer, let's go back to this one. You know, it's time to go around, right? You have a valid business reason for going around. I'll talk about that in a second. So a little more on, on how executives are different because I want to segue into uh, valid business reason. I hope that answers your question, Andy. If not, you know, send me, send me a follow-up there. Executives are not like, like, like normal people. They're not like managers. They think fundamentally differently. They don't worry about how things are done. They focus on the where and trust others to do the how, right? Um, far more conceptual as it pertains to things happening, but far more specific as it pertains to the results of those things. Exactly the opposite of most functional buyers. Most functional buyers are obsess obsessed with how this is going to work, can rarely articulate the how, all right? Or sorry, the, uh, the where we're going. They want to know a lot of detail about, you know, how this is going to happen, features, functionality, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't really know why they're doing something. They don't really have compelling business reasons for what's going on. They do stuff versus decide stuff. Executives don't actually care about technology. If you're having a technology conversation, it's not being driven by an executive. Unless it's maybe a CIO or a CTO when they're dealing with really high level stuff like, you know, protocols and security and things like that. More than anything, they don't care about your demo, right? Again, a demo is a how, a demo doesn't show where. So executives are trying to figure out how they're gonna get their bonus, how they're gonna navigate their quarterly objectives, how they're gonna keep their job, right? How they're gonna move up in the organization, right? They, they, they fundamentally think differently than, than everybody else. So we've understand the psychology of an executive, we have decided we got to get there. Now let's talk about, you know, getting ready. As I said before, executives will answer any question I ask as long as it's perceived to align with their interest or their intent, right? Um, asking simply, you know, how much are you willing to spend on this is a question that, that, that might be perceived as coming from a place of wanting to negotiate a higher price, right? So understanding, you know, what the executive cares about, what they're tied to is really critical. I'll get into an example of, of specific alignment of objectives in a minute. But the question you have to ask yourself is, am I asking this question or going to the executive just because I feel I need to, or do I actually feel like it's in the interest of the company? And more importantly, do I feel like my reaching out to the executives is something that I can truthfully say is intended to help them, their company, their career, etc. Simple example, if I was dealing with a, 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 a situation where a budget had been, had been established that was far too low and the person that I was talking to, you know, say we're redesigning a website, right? You want, you want, a, you want a kick ass corporate website in 2016, you're not spending 15 grand on it. Right, you're spending a hundred thousand, two hundred, three thousand, three hundred thousand. That's what a real website costs. It's not, you know, your your cousin in a basement building it. If I was talking to somebody at a, at a sizable company who was insistent, say it was a marketing person, that they were going to redo the website and all they could spend was twenty thousand, and despite multiple attempts to, you know, help them understand that that wasn't going to work, and and all they came back was, well, that's what the VP gave me, right? Um, and I said, well, let's go talk to the VP together. And they wouldn't do that. I would want to call the VP. My intention would be to alert the executive, not that they didn't have enough money to give me because they don't care about that, but that the money that they had, you know, currently allocated for a new website was unrealistic, was burning their people's time, right? Because they were running around trying to find vendors that did this and fundamentally was going to set them back and cause them to spend more and, and, and do more work and, and, and potentially even hurt their brand. So I would go to the executive with a very clear intent 
if I believed that I had something that they needed to know about and, and could choose to act on or not. If I'm getting ready to go to the executive, not only do I make sure my intent is there, I need to have a clear objective. You don't go to an executive and say, yeah, I just want to tell them some stuff. And frankly, you don't go to an executive and, and, and just say, I want to ask them some stuff, all right? An objective for me is something that has occurred, uh, something that has happened, something that I can achieve. So a uh, very recent deal, I was coaching uh, one of the guys that I work with on, and uh, we were actually in a pilot. We're doing a pilot uh, and trying to convert to a, uh, a subscription. And the CEO has been very little involved, a uh, little involvement in the, in the pilot process. And all of the stakeholders have been, uh, have been participating. And they've said, here's the, the business objectives we have. Here's the, you know, the timing. Here's what's driving, it, et cetera. The intent of the meeting was to get to the CEO and ensure that the objectives, the, uh, the, the desired outcomes, and, and all the details presented by the stakeholders in fact aligned with his objectives, right? Did, did what we were hearing, right? The intention was, is what we were hearing from you know, his team accurate? Were we getting 100% straight? We wanted to validate it, all right? Uh, you could say, well, didn't they get pissed off you didn't trust them? No, it wasn't about that. People hear things differently, right? In fact, we told the stakeholders we'd be going. We told them, listen, you've been very candid with us. However, because this is so important, we want to make sure we hear it firsthand and we can come back and calibrate with you guys. Maybe there's a tweak here. Maybe we got something wrong. Maybe it's perfect, but at least we'll all know. That was the intention was to make sure that the efforts the organization was, was, was undertaking were you know, aligned at all levels. The objective, in addition to confirming that, was to secure the CEO's uh, approval to go back to him, what we call return access, if at any time during the project, what we were intending to do was not lining up with what was happening or if the project was slipping. So the most important objective for us was to have the ability to go back to the CEO in the future if we needed some air cover, we needed some help. One of the tricks, and I'm going to try to speed it up here because we're coming up at 3 o'clock. One of the tricks that I often recommend to do this is if you're going to try and get a meeting with an executive, write your follow-up email before you do anything else, right? My view is if you've had a successful meeting that you've prepped for, that you've worked to get, you're going to send a follow-up. Hey, thanks to meet you. It was great to meet you. Here's what we discussed. Here's what I heard you say. Here's what we agreed to do next, right? That's a, that's a standard follow-up email. Hopefully, you guys are writing them. If you can write a clear and concise and powerful follow-up email, you're ready to go have that meeting. And there's a good chance you're going to get right where you said you should be. Okay? A couple quick questions. Ba -ba -ba -ba. What would be your advice when selling through instead of to, but trying to get to an executive, but your point person said, it all gets funneled through me? Interesting. Let's keep going. Uh, perfect timing, Logan. Couldn't have done that better. First thing is this. If you ask for permission to go around somebody, um, they're going to say no. Uh, you got to be careful not to sanction somebody to block you. I agree to work with you and through you, but I'm never going to give up my right to go around you. So I don't ever say, would it be okay? Do you mind? Do you think we could? I don't even work from a, I got to talk to the executive. I work from a, here are the things I need to know in the conversation. The first thing I'm going to do is go to my contact and say, so Logan, uh, I have a concern that this project does not have the VP's attention. And absent that, I believe, based on my past experience, that we're running the risk of getting up there and being told no. Therefore, I need to make sure that this has the proper attention at the sea level. Uh, would you like to, you know, go and, and, and forward an email for me that I'm going to send and, and, and get that done? Or would it make more sense just for me to go to the, the CEO myself? Right? So I need what I need. You can come with me, you can do it for me, or you can get out of my way, but I'm never going to sanction the ability to, uh, you know, to just, to just, you know, oh, sorry, it gets funneled through me. I will respect that, right? If you can, in fact, get it done, great. If it's funneled through you, I'm going to write an email uh, with some very specific questions. I'd like you to forward that, and I'd like to see the answers, All right? If you can help me with that, fantastic. Another method, another method is what I call the air cover concept, right? Um, 
most of the people on this call, most people in sales are not the CEO, right? We have bosses, we have CEOs for our company. So while somebody who's blocking you can certainly say, no, you can't go around me, everything funnels through me. Uh, and you may believe that going around them runs a risk of, you know, basically getting you booted out or, or baking an enemy or what have you. All that said, you can't stop your CEO from sending an email or picking up the phone. So many times what I'll do when I'm stuck behind somebody or just sense that the, the risk of going around them is too much, I'll take my CEO aside and say, hey, here's the deal. I need to get this. I can't go around. Let me prep you. Let me get you an email. I need you to call on the CEO directly and say, hey, this is the CEO, CEO of ABC Company. My buddy Logan's over there doing this deal with you. I'm just calling to make sure this has your attention because Logan's spending a lot of time on this and I don't want my team wasting their time if it's not going to happen. And I know you don't want your team wasting their time, you know, on, on a deal that, that, that you don't really want them doing. So air cover is an incredibly powerful way to get information you need just by leveraging other people in your company, right? If, if you're a sole practitioner, it's just you can be tough, but most of us work for a company. Um, I, I, I actually, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm ashamed to admit it, but I've been in situations where I'm in a sales team and I'll, this was before LinkedIn and people could verify this, but I'll literally have somebody else on my team call pretending to be my boss and ask questions that I couldn't ask several levels up. So contrary to popular belief, you never want to bring your CEO into a meeting at the level you're at. You want them to go several levels up and establish a separate relationship. So hopefully, hopefully that helps a little bit, Logan. So what, what are valid business reasons, right? What are reasons to talk to an executive, right? You don't call them to say, just want to check in, touch base, I show you my demo. Those are not reasons to get to an executive. That's what you're trying to do. Just skip it. You have the right, and, and I would say in many cases, the responsibility to get to an executive when you need to ensure everyone, yourself and your buyer is using their time wisely. Is this deal real? Any executive, most executives, will take a five minute call from somebody saying, the sole purpose of me calling is to make sure that the project I've been working on with Bob, who by the way, you know, is great and we're doing great stuff, has your attention and that we are, you know, both progressing to a, a goal that you want to want to achieve, right? Trust me, executives will take that call. Executives will take your call if you need to gain access to information that's relevant to serving them that nobody else has been able to give you. Again, that's the case where you might want to say to your contact, hey, let's go together. You can go ask or I'll go get it. But executives understand that not everything that's in their head, their people get or is unclear. And if they are in fact, you know, eyes on this project and there's information that people don't have, you know, by way of example, you can pick up the phone and say, I've been talking to folks in your team. I understand you're building a new website. There are three things that nobody in your team has been able to answer. And I don't believe I can effectively serve your company, you know, generate a good proposal and, 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 and help you be successful unless I had the answer to two questions. Here they are, all right? Confirming understanding of true need, that's a very, very, very to that. Finally, validating where they're in the buying process, right? So-and-so has been telling me you're gonna buy this. Uh, they're pushing for a proposal. Smells to me like this is a next year initiative and you need a budgetary number. I'm happy to do that. I wanna support you guys, but I, I need to understand in terms of where you guys really are in the process. Last but not least, it is a valid business reason to contact an executive if you are looking to have them intervene or change the rules. High risk maneuver, right? Essentially, you're saying to the, the executive, the person you've put in charge of this is not doing this the right way. They're making bad decisions and I need you to coach them or course correct them or, or reprioritize things for them. Not a surprise that this is going to, you know, put your relationship in jeopardy with the contact may or may not be worth doing. You're going to have to decide that. But fundamentally, if I'm in a game that I'm losing already, right, because the, 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 teal, the field is tilted against me, well, it's probably worth the risk. If I am not getting the information I need, if, if the person that I'm supposedly working with to buy this is being so stubborn and obstinate in the sales process, it's unlikely you're going to have a successful customer. And I think, you know, in the age of SaaS and in the age of a focus on customer success, more and more companies understand just because they bought something, if they buy the wrong thing, it's going to cost them more money in the long run. Um, Tim asked a question, do you use any other supporting materials like video, emails, et cetera, to move deals through the pipeline? The answer is no. Uh, I do use lots of materials to build and establish my relationship, 
But I promise you, nothing you send them, not a proposal, not an email, not a video email, that doesn't move the deal. Nothing I send you moves the deal forward. The only thing that moves the deal forward is the interaction between two people. Um, and I'll go back and I'll say it again. A proposal does not advance a deal. A proposal is how I articulate my services and my price, but nothing, uh, you know, nothing you send them is going to actually move the deal forward other than interaction. Um, same question on that. Okay, good. We're rocking and rolling here. So a couple ways of getting there. There's the direct approach. I'm just going to call the executive. There's the via referral. If you, uh, you know, if, if you know somebody that knows somebody, one of the great things in, uh, you know, in this day and age is through LinkedIn, I can find the executives, I can see who I know and get other people to help, whether it's, you know, my executives or people in my network. You know, you can call somebody that's not at your company who happens to know the CEO and say, listen, I really need to get a question answered. We're working a deal over there. Would you mind shooting them an email? Nothing wrong with that. Get your friends to sell for you, right? Cultivate a network of executives and powerful people that know other powerful people and then ask them to help out because as executives, they'll appreciate the fact that you are trying to act in this company's best interest. What they will think is, well, I wish somebody would come to me with that if it was off the rails. So I'm certainly happy to help. And then finally, which was the, uh, you know, the topic of the whole presentation is, how do we get there through the EA, through the executive assistant? Make sure I'm not missing any questions. Ba -ba 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 -ba. All right. So if I'm going to do it directly, and I sort of alluded to a lot of this, you got to have a clear and valid business reason um, if I'm trying to get the executive myself, my tricks are I call early and I call late. I've, I've called executives five in the morning, six in the morning, seven at night. They will answer this phone if you have their direct number. If you have the number that routes to the, uh, to the executive assistant, it might be a little tougher. And also persistence, persistence, persistence. I might call an executive's desk if I know they tend to be there late at night. I might call six o'clock and call them 10 times. Right? If I need to talk to the VP, if I need to talk to the CEO, I'm not shy about calling them 10 times in an hour because I'm calling with a valid business reason, right? And then of course, email and LinkedIn. You know, again, email and LinkedIn are, are tricky. You know, I get, I get a ton of these things every day in, in LinkedIn where people are saying, hey, I got this, take it a look at it, don't you want to buy it? A very powerful message which leads with, here's the information I'd like to know to understand, here's what I want you to know because it's important for your company. Can I have five minutes of your time? That gets opened, right? The rambling, blah, 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 we've been working with you and really want to get your take on things. That doesn't get opened. So i uh, going to get into the gatekeeper here and I'll, I'll try to wrap it up real quick. But um, before I talk about the exact how, I want to be clear that I define four kinds of, of gatekeepers, right? The first two are, are, are really simple gatekeepers, right? They're, they're, they're nice people. They route calls. They're actually not you know, people of, of importance in the sales process, but you do need to be polite and respectful with them, right? There's the receptionist, the front desk person, right? That's not anything more than somebody who routes calls. They have no power. And then there's a gatekeeper, right? A lot of times, you know, for a law office, by way of example, they do screening and routing and they'll say, you know, is this a vendor? What are you calling about? And they might just shut you down, but mostly what they do is route through voicemail. So make sure you understand who you're talking to uh, and always be respectful to every one of them because, you know, if you're not, then uh, that will find its way to the person you're trying to get to. But do not sanction a, a receptionist or a gatekeeper to block you. It's really not their power. They can say, oh, they don't take sales calls or they don't want to talk to you. It doesn't matter. Their opinion about who's going to talk to me doesn't matter. I'm still going to be polite. I might answer something, hey, I really appreciate that, but I will continue to reach, try and reach Mr. Johnson until I catch him live. It's a matter of high importance. Thanks so much. I look forward to talking to you again. But I'm not going to you know, take their advice to not call again. The other two kinds of gatekeepers, and they're very similar, uh, are ones that you do need to treat, you know, as your customer, as your prospect, right? If you can get directly to the prospect, then obviously you don't need to worry about it. But in most cases, these individuals are empowered on some level to support and help the, uh, you know, the executive. The calendar keeper, right, uh, they have the power to put you on a schedule, deny you access, etc. The executive assistant is the one who uh, basically will be your customer. And I'll give you a simple example. A uh, long, long time ago, I was selling to uh, AT&T Wireless. And the CIO there, who actually ended up becoming a, a pretty good, good friend of mine, had a wonderful assistant. And they had a very specific process for how she would present vendors and things to him. She owned his calendar. 
Like literally, he did not put stuff on his own calendar. That's how powerful an executive assistant she was. Anybody that wanted a meeting from the CEO to his, his folks went through her. Anytime he wanted to put something on his calendar, call a meeting, he just said, I need a meeting with so-and-so and she would figure it out. He was literally just, you manage my time. And she did it in an incredible way because, you know, the guy was, was running a, whatever it is, you know, $100 billion company. And, you know, you need people like that. Um, when you're talking to these folks, when you're, when you're interacting with gatekeepers and such, you want to, and frankly, everybody, you want to avoid these soft words. Hey, is there any chance? Could you possibly? Would, it, would you matter? No, you want to know why you're there, know the reason you're, you know, seeking access and ask specific questions and make declarative statements. Um, when working through the EA, a couple things to keep in mind. They are your customer. In fact, I'll tell you in a minute, you need their number, right? The, the executive assistant can tell if you called them or you called the, you know, the executive and it simply routes to them. So if I'm going to target an executive assistant, one of the first things I do is I go to the front switchboard or what have you, and I get their direct line so I can call them directly. I'll actually create a record in Salesforce for their name. Whereas somebody who's not an executive assistant, I, I don't, I don't, I don't put them in there. I might, I might, I might have a notation of who answered the phone, but an EA is my customer. You need to understand specifically what their, their, their role is, right? Um, how do they work with the executive? Um, what, you know, what, what do they do? What, what, what function do they provide? How do they help them make their lives easier, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a concept we call, we talk about called a letter of introduction, which is the means of communicating who you are and what you want to the executive, right? The, the, the executive assistant really isn't making a determination in real time if you're a fit. They'll simply say, okay, I'll, I'll tell them you called, then they'll scribble it on a sticky note, and the next time they walk in, they say, oh, there's some, some Townsend from ABC company. Do you want to talk to them? No. Well, that's not an effective way to communicate you know, who you are and what you want, so we need to think better about you know, how we're going to get that, that message across. If you're scribbling, or if the executive assistant is simply scribbling some notes on a on a, on, a, you know, on, on a sticky note and handing it to them, your chances of getting a meeting are, are very, very low. I'll give you some more on this in a second. Lastly, who should be meeting, right? In a lot of situations, both to protect your political capital at that you know, customer you're selling into, as well as you know, from, a, from a perception standpoint, it's a lot easier if you do the legwork, but ultimately position somebody higher than you and your company to talk to the executives. It's a fact. CEOs talk to CEOs. CEOs don't talk to salespeople, all right? So if you have somebody you can leverage in your company, like your founder or your CEO, call them, get their commitment to help you, tell them you'll do all the legwork to set it up and, and prep them for the meeting, but humble yourself a little bit and basically say, I'm, I'm gonna get a meeting with the executive that I need, but I'm gonna make it between the executive and my CEO. And then of course, you know, make sure you have a very specific purpose for the meeting. Here's the process, specifics, and again, trying to keep this going. You call the EA directly. As with any other prospect, you ask for their time. Hey, have I caught you at a bad time? Uh, this is Townsend with so-and-so. I wanted to you know, spend five minutes with you. Is now a good time or should we schedule something? They will tell you. They're busy people, right? Chances are they got a lot going on. You're going to you know, get a lot more credit by treating them as a respectful prospect and scheduling time with them later in the day when it's less busy, right? The chances of you catching an EA with nothing going on right this minute very low. Great. How about we get together at one o'clock today? Can I send you a meeting invite, right? Treat them like your customer. If you're talking to what you know is an executive assistant for a high power executive, you need to immediately take the vantage point of, I'm going to be working through you. If you tell me, right, if I call an executive assistant and I try to bully past you and you're shutting me down, that's a very different dynamic than me calling you and saying, Hi, Mrs. Johnson. This is Towns with so and so. I've caught you at a bad time. Listen, Ms. Johnson. The person, uh, sorry, the purpose of my call is I'm actually looking to schedule a brief phone conversation between my CEO and uh, Mr. Williams, your boss. My assumption is I can work with you or work through you on this process. Is that accurate? Think of the tone, right? I'm setting that up with respect. I'm acknowledging that this is their role and importance, and and I'm and I'm I'm putting everything on the table. Right? Generally, they're going to say, yes, that's correct. That's a hell of a lot different than trying to get past them and then having them come back and say, oh, no, no, you got to work through me. Right? So if I'm proactive, I gain a lot of ground. The next thing is you got to get some time with them. You have to understand when and how they communicate with their boss. Right? 
They don't take your message, get up, walk in, hand it, and walk back out. This is not like the 60s or something. When I uh, was working with, with AT&T Wireless, what I found out was that um, Mike, once a week, had a standing meeting with his assistant who would bring in a stack of all of the requests for his time and go through them. It took about you know an hour, half an hour, whatever it was. You know, and it was literally this person, this person, this person. She'd go through this. It was on the calendar. He would say yes or no. Yes, I'll give him 10 minutes. Nope, no one to meet with him. Yes, I'll give him a half an hour. All right? That was the process that they used to screen non-familiar people. The executive does not wing it with their executive assistant. Everything they do as a process, including deciding whether or not you're going to get to meet with them. So it's kind of important to understand how that works. All right? In the context of understanding how they do it, well, I meet with them once a week. As things come in, I leave them on their desk. This is when I suggest a letter of introduction. Well, what I'd like to do is put together a letter of introduction from my CEO presenting who we are, the purpose of our meeting, and the formal request. Uh, is that something you would be comfortable presenting to Mr. and Mrs. Big Shot? All right, and I'll show you a letter of recommendation in a second. Assuming they say yes, which they will, because instead of writing it on a sticky note, you're going to send them the talking points, the letter. It gives them a tool to sell you, a tool to present you, makes their life easier. If they've said yes, then you're going to need to come up with a calendar, right? Great. Well, uh, when do you meet with Mr. Johnson? I meet with him on Tuesdays. Fantastic. I would like to have a letter of introduction in your inbox on Monday. Uh, I'd love to have a quick call Monday afternoon just to make sure it's clear and that it meets your needs. And then assuming you talk to him on Tuesday, I'd love to follow up with you on, on, on Tuesday afternoon and, and see if we were, were granted the privilege of a meeting, All right? So you, you create a whole path for how you're gonna work with them, which you'd probably get to anyway, but if you're ahead of it and proactive, you actually look like you know what you're doing and you make their life easy and they want you to be successful, right? Versus the other 99 out of 100 vendors that try to bully past them and just say, well, take this down and tell them this. You know what happens to that note? It might make it to the executive, it might just go in the trash. So aligning with their process uh, really taking to heart the challenge and complexities of, of their job and how hard it is, is, is actually pretty important. Here's an example of a, uh, uh, of a letter of recommendation, or sorry, uh, a letter of introduction, right? Not all that complicated. The idea is, um, who are you? What do you want, right? Why do you want it? And uh, do we have your permission? The ask, right? Very simple. My name is, this is actually one I helped the client with, right? Um, it was an easy one here, right? Because CEOs in big letters. Uh, we threw in one of the leading women-owned companies and blah, 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 right? Because that gets you some points. I'm sending you this email because we've been on it now. And actually, this, this is interesting. This, this, this letter of introduction is for a cold introduction, which, by the way, works like a charm. I would, I would copy this down, screenshot it, whatever you need to do. But it's trying to get in the door. This works very effectively. Imagine if you're already in the sales process and have a very compelling... Uh, valid business reason in terms of we need to understand your need. We have a concern about the budget you've allocated, you know, what, what, whatever the reason is, same context. All right. Rocking and rolling here. Almost done. Uh, going to send an email after the call in today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the recording uh, processed and up and all that good stuff. You'll have a link to it. If you have more questions, you know, went a little long here today. I'll stick around for more questions. But if you have more, you can email me anytime. I'm happy to help. Anything you need more clarity on that's, that's been going on in this, uh, in this presentation, feel, let me know. Um, when you're interacting with me, I will tell you that specific situations are, are far better than theoretical, right? So I'd love to help you with, you know, hey, here's the situation. Here's where I'm stuck. Send me an email about it, right? The theoretical of, well, do you ever do this? Those are good questions, but... You know, call me anytime. Call me or email me or whatever in a year when you're working a deal and say, you know, hey, how would you handle this? Or I'm stuck. How do I handle it? I'm happy to help with that. So that's my uh, that's my offer extended to you all for your, your low price of 20 bucks, right? All right. With that, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, my voice is tired and you guys are probably tired of listening to me. But I hope this has been uh, helpful. I'll stick around. If um, if you got more questions, you can email them to me. You can also uh, shoot them via message on the bottom of this thing and I'll stick around for a few more minutes.